This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. Okay, so today we have Nathan Carson, a wolf reader, musician, writer. It just he does it all. This is going to be really good. How are you doing, Nathan? Yeah. Great. Thanks for having me. You're a musician. How's that going for you the last year? <laughs> well, we haven't done a lot because we just sort of decided early in the pandemic that all of us have other, you know, obligations and families and things to be concerned about during the pandemic. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if, if the band was our full-time day job, that would be one thing. Uh, But since it's not, I didn't want to be one of the many artists just standing there with my hat out looking for a handout uh, or donations. Mm -hmm. So we did make uh, masks with our logo very early on and we sold (laughs) through those and Bandcamp, which is a really wonderful platform for selling music digitally, has been doing this really cool thing once a month where they waived all of their commissions for, uh, and gave all of the proceeds to artists. So we tended to mention on those days that we had merch for sale, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, long story short, the only thing we really did this year was remotely recorded a Soundgarden cover that was exclusively premiered at the Roadburn Festival in the Netherlands, uh, virtually. And that went really well. And we even got a really nice note from Kim Thale, the guitarist of Soundgarden, complimenting us on our rendition. So that was cool. Otherwise, next year is the 25th anniversary of the band. So we're really kind of gearing up to tour and record for that. We do have a couple of music festivals in uh, late August and September that we're scheduled to play. And it's seeming promising at this point. My day job is as a booking agent for 30 bands from around the world, including my own. So, Mm -hmm. you know, for a year, I had no work in my main field. And in the last two weeks, it's just kind of snowballed and returned. It's almost like (laughs) back to normal again. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what really happens because there are still the variants and a lot of people who are not getting vaccinated. So th- those are throwing major curveballs at those of us that are trying to safely reactivate. But uh, fingers crossed that we can get through this bumpy section of the rapids and get back to gathering safely and making music because I love it. And the name of your band? We're called Witch Mountain. And it's a very bluesy doom metal band uh, in the vein of Black Sabbath. But I would say we're a lot less derivative than a lot of bands in that style. Uh, Our singer, she's got a very soulful, powerful voice. Our guitar player is very much a Hendrix acolyte. We're very into a lot of music from the 60s and 70s, but also, I would say, with a modern heaviness to it. So I guess the best thing to do is look us up and give it a spin and see if you like it. If you search for Witch Mountain, you're either going to find the Disney movie or us. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I, I hate to tell you who's going to come up first. but <laughs> And also, you're a writer. You've done a lot of writing for, for comic books, graphic novels, short stories. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I was interested in writing from a young age. And in high school in the 80s, I wrote a lot of really terrible pastiches of Clive Barker and Lovecraft. And by about 19, uh, at already an obsessed wolf fan. I read on his written recommendation, Damon Knight's Creating Short Fiction book. And in that book, Damon Knight, Mm -hmm. who I actually once met at a bookstore in Eugene where I was working, um, in that book, he says, if you're under 30, you should go out and get some life experience because otherwise you just won't really have a perspective to draw from. And so I took that to heart (laughs) and I've had many careers since. I've traveled a lot. I've met, you know, thousands of people. and And especially as a touring musician, I've been to 30 different countries. And so about seven years ago, when I turned 40, I said, you know, I know how to not be a hobbyist or dilettante. I know how to produce work. And I've wanted to do fiction this entire time. And especially after sort of a 20-year apprenticeship as a journalist, I had been keeping my writing chops up. I'd learned to work with editors. I knew about word economy. And I knew about deadlines. So I sat down and started writing stories and it's gone very well. And I've sold stories to, I don't know, somewhere between a dozen and 20 anthologies and magazines in the last six or seven years. I wrote a novella called Star Creek 
And then I was invited to do a graphic novel adaptation of Algernon Blackwood's The Willows. So on a small press scale, it's been going very well. And I actually made my first sale to a bigger house just a couple of months ago, but I'm not allowed to talk about it yet. It's okay. You can just tell me. No, no. <laughs> and let's see. You've done a lot of uh, you did a lot of nonfiction. Right? You did a lot of interviews with musicians and all. I was reading your stuff actually on your website this morning. Yeah, yeah. I was reading the article on Paul Simon uh, doing his farewell tour. What is okay? You're a musician. What is with that? Who are we, who are we kidding here? He's a musician. How do you retire from that? That's like saying, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna retire from from writing. I'm just not going to do it anymore. Who's it doesn't sound believable. Sure. I mean, I'm sure he will continue to record music. I think he was only talking about touring, retiring from touring. Although at that concert that I was previewing, he pretty much implied that he was not done and that he <laughs> would perhaps come again. But then the pandemic comes. And I mean, if there's anyone I feel sorry for in the in the music world right now, besides small venues that are you know trying to cling on for dear life, it's kind of the septuagenarian musician set, people who these were really crucial years for the end of their career. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to lose a year or two when you're only getting older and your voice is getting weaker and your hands are aching. I mean, it's, it's just really tough for those folks. I actually work with a few of them and, and I feel for them because these, these were the years where they were kind of going to get that last gasp. So yeah, hopefully uh, in 2022, if you see your favorite, you know, elderly musicians hitting the road, this is your chance. Go see them. Yeah, definitely. Well, all right. Hey, are you ready to play our game? Absolutely. Okay. So what's your first encounter with a wolf story? It was Shadow of the Torture, the Timescape paperback. I was in high school, probably 1989. And a friend of mine who was a precocious nerd like myself, who was interested in a lot of underground music and transgressive art and weird science fiction, he knew that I liked Elric and Lovecraft and Samuel Delany. And he handed me a copy of Shadow of the Torture and said, I think you're going to dig this. And it just blew me away. I was already at a point where, you know, in my high school English classes, I was reading James Joyce and Thomas Hardy and people like that. So I felt pretty prepared for the vocabulary and the depth. And I think, especially because I have so many interests in both like highbrow snobby culture but also a lot of lowbrow stuff like heavy metal and horror movies and to read someone as literary as wolf but who was writing science fiction stories about torturers at the end of time everything about that appealed you know i love the writing i <laughs> i would say i was even more of a fan of the really ornate intricate prose then because I was coming from this kind of, you know, post Lovecraft place. So the idea of hyperbole and um, just extreme density was a perk to me. I would say now as a writer, I'm not looking for that as much in writing as I was then, mm -hmm. but I still greatly appreciate it. And certainly some of Wolf's later works, I'm often disappointed when the prose isn't as beautiful as it was in the 70s and 80s for him. So anyway, right. Shadow of the Torture was it. It was a landmark. It hit me really hard. And I, of course, you know, read everything that I could after that. And I am not an academic. I don't have an MFA, but I tell people my MFA is having read 30 Gene Wolfe novels. <laughs> well, that will do it. Yeah. Favorite Wolfe novel or short story, either or both? As, as far as novel, I think Peace is my favorite. I love the writing of that. I love the nested stories within, the dreamlike quality of it. And I think it just captures Wolf at a really great point where he wasn't famous yet. He didn't... I mean, I think that he had to become somewhat self-conscious of, of a writer after getting all of the accolades and awards that he did for Book of the New Sun. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard not to become a little bit self-conscious about, you know, who your readers are. Whereas I think when he wrote Peace, he probably wrote that for himself and, and for his editor and was really unaffected at that point in time. As far as shorter stories, I'm always drawn back to his novellas like yeah. Fifth Head of Cerberus and Seven American Nights. I think that, I mean, he does do really well with very short pieces as well. 
But I think I like the novella length for him because it gives him a chance to stretch out and tell a really amazing story, but without having to reach the novel lengths or abridge it for for a really short piece. So sure, yeah, no, no, that's a I as I say so often, novellas are the perfect length for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, favorite wolf word. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if favorite word is the right term for this, but some the tick that I notice in reading his work the most, especially having read so much of it, is how often he is obsessed with the way people nod. He nodded to show that he understood. Like that comes up so often. And I even asked him mm-hmm. about it when I interviewed him. And, and his answer was simply that there are different types of nods and he wants to, you know, explain which kind of a nod that is. But at a certain point, when you've read enough of his work and seen that enough times, it almost becomes hilarious uh, <laughs> because it's, <laughs> I don't know. its it, I consider it a tick in his work, but it's one that makes me smile every time I see it. Oh, that's, yeah, I, I think you're the first to pick up on a, a wolf word being a, you know, a, a common phrase. Or... Mm-hmm. Okay, well, personal, non-consensus theory about a wolf story or your favorite one? Hmm. I mean, I I really enjoy Seven American Nights because of the psychedelic aspect of it. Mm-hmm. The hallucinogen that's in the egg and which day he took it, if at all, is something that's always kind of fascinated me because, you know, at the time when I was discovering Wolf, I was also doing a lot of my own psychedelic exploration, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in a very intellectual way, I would say. I mean, I was not, I didn't drink beer. I didn't smoke cigarettes. I was not in it for a party. I, I was really, you know, it, it was true exploration at that time. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that he writes so vividly and so convincingly about psychedelic experience was really impressive to me. And so again, when I interviewed him, I brought that up. And the way I prefaced it was I said, you know, you were in the Korean War, you saw action, and you were able to write about combat in a way that someone who has not been in a war simply could not. But I also find that you write about psychedelics in that way. And his firm response was, if you're asking me if I've ever tried LSD, the answer is no. (laughs) Now, I tend to take him at his word. At the same time, I feel like men of his generation, you know, were the kind of people who said they didn't inhale, you know, like Mm -hmm. the odds that he smoked a bowl with Damon and Kate at some point in the 60s or 70s seems high to me or Harlan Ellison, or or anyone that he was carousing with. But we'll never know, and it's just not the sort of thing that people talked about from his age and time and place, let alone people who live in small-town Illinois, where, um, you know, if it was legalized, it was recently, if at all. So, Uh, Speaking of your interview with Gene Wolfe, what was your reaction based on that? I mean, it was such an honor to do that. It was funny. Basically, what happened was, I had this uh, this feeling like, you know, I've never met Gene Wolfe. He's been my favorite writer for decades. He's not he's getting on in years. If I don't make an effort to meet him soon, I never will and then I will regret it. And I had noticed that he, you know, at his advanced age and with his health issues, had really stopped attending most of the major conventions. But I did a search and I noticed that he was playing the Shambanicon, which was a very small science fiction convention about 20 miles from where he lived and that he was going to be the guest of honor. So I sent an email to the organizers and said, hey, I'm a published author. I'm a big fan of Gene Wolfe. If I come out to your convention, could I get a reading slot? And they said, absolutely, that would be great. So I was like, okay, I'm buying my flights. I'm coming out to this. I'm going to meet Gene Wolfe, maybe get some books signed. And then the festival organizers wrote to me a few days later and they said, you know, we need somebody to do a one hour interview with Mr. Wolf. Would you like to do that? Oh, wow. And I said, (laughs) hell yes, I would love to. And so, you know, I had done a lifetime of homework, but I did even more. And I knew that he simply is not the kind of person that wants to answer, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. questions about mysteries in his work. He's not, he's like David Lynch in that way. He, he wants the reader to mull it over and puzzle it out for themselves. And he's and so I did not make a list of mysteries to be resolved because mm-hmm. I feel, felt like that would just make him clam up. So instead, I really just tried to get him 
talking and uh, and enjoying himself. And there's a 66 minute video of it. I've got it unlisted on YouTube, but I'm happy to share it with any Gene Wolf fanatics. You're welcome to share the URL. Uh, yeah, yeah. To your fans, if you'd like, or anyone who writes me. Uh, I'm happy to share it with them. The only reason I haven't made it public is that there was a second camera angle of the same thing. And I would rather look at that um, with cuts between two different cameras instead of one camera angle for 66 minutes. But the bottom line is the content and the discussion that we had. Yeah, most of them are just going to listen anyway. Right. So, so I'm, I'm really happy that we were able to have such a great discussion. And apparently he enjoyed it too because he thanked the festival organizers for uh, for having someone who, you know, I wasn't there just saying, so how did you get started writing fiction? You know, like, you know, yeah, I, yeah. where do you get right, your ideas? So, you know, there was none of that. And so I think that kept him engaged. And at the end of it, the festival folks, they said, thanks for knowing your shit. He really had a good time. <laughs> so that was a really great experience. And especially since, you know, within a few years he was gone. So I'm really thankful to have gotten to meet him, spoken with him, and you know, had a, a few of my special items signed. How would you feel about putting the link in the show notes? That'd be absolutely great. All right, yay! Um, most frustrating mystery in a wolf story, <laughs> any story. You know, it's funny. I guess I personally don't get hung up on wolf's mysteries that much. I appreciate them, and it's something that I enjoy in his writing, but. To me, I would rather spend my time either reading another story or another book. Uh, not that I don't reread Wolf. I certainly do. And I think that's that he's meant to be reread. I think the second or third reading of any Wolf story is often better than the first. In my case, it's always better than the first. It's, the first is the worst. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that's a wonderful thing about him. However... I'm not going to get hung up making notes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that what you're doing where you're rereading it with a friend and discussing it, that sounds like a good time. You know, that's like having a reading group. I'm, I'm all for that, <laughs> but I'm just not an academic person. I don't enjoy taking notes and I would rather read another wolf story rather than read the same one 17 times beating my head against the wall. Mm -hmm. But since you asked um, a solar labyrinth from stories from the old hotel is a very short and wonderful wolf piece. He said that it was one of his favorites, although somehow it didn't end up in the best of that he curated. <laughs> in the introduction to that collection, he mentions that there's a sinister element in that story that most people don't notice. And that is the one question I did ask him along those lines, and he dodged it or said he didn't remember when I talked to him. Mm -hmm. And I'm still curious just what he means by that. I mean, there are so many different ways to read that phrase, you know, it, the solar labyrinth itself has a minotaur in the center. There are allusions to other mythological figures like Ariadne. You know, just the fact that the maze itself is made of shadows and light. That the ending, the man is left there with some unnamed young boy. I am just not really sure what he's getting at there. But I also haven't gone to, you know, extensively look at what other people have said about that story. So perhaps someone else has puzzled out an answer. Oh, well, I'm sure Borsky thinks he has, but <laughs> <laughs> that's my issue with Borsky. I, <laughs> I'm amused by his theories, but they all just seem so tangential. I mean, I feel like I could sit and write, you know, made up ideas that could possibly be the case all day long. Um, but as long as he's having fun with it, good for him. Oh yeah. Well, I, that might be fun to go through and the, the way we go through the book of the sun to puzzle out, you know, what the heck is going on in the solar labyrinth? Sure. Yeah. I'd like that. Yeah. I, I mean, personally, I, I, it takes me forever to finish a, a wolf story and to walk away from it because I feel like, Oh man, I've got, I have to know, <laughs> I have to know what it's about. I can't, it's, it's not enough for, as uh, David Knight described the changeling that he doesn't know what it, what it's about, but he knows it means something. And that, that's not good enough for me. I have to know exactly what it means mm -hmm. and what it's about. I guess because I know there are people like you and Mark um, and Borsky and Michael out there, I feel like I'll leave that heavy lifting to you guys. <laughs> it's kind of like I don't want to work on my, my car myself because there's a mechanic who spent decades like mastering that. Mm. And so 
I'm, I'm going to put my time into going and writing another story rather than uh, beating my head against the wall, trying to, trying to figure out something from someone who didn't even want to explain it to us in the first <laughs> place. I, I mean, part of it is that Wolf himself was not an academic and he was not, he didn't like critics and he didn't want mm-hmm. to explain his work. So to me, I would rather be the kind of reader that I think that he wanted to be or, or wanted to have. Um, having said that, there's no way someone writes work that sophisticated that isn't in the back of his mind thinking, after I'm dead, people are going to study this and puzzle over it forever. I mean, it's a, it's a really brilliant way to add longevity to your work, I think, is to have unanswerable questions that people will discuss for eternity. And so I think he's really successful in that way. And for a long, long time, I've said that when Wolf dies, he will finally be you know, treated as literature and studied at universities. And I, I hope we see more of that because he certainly belongs there. It's always been a bummer that somehow being affiliated with the ghetto of science fantasy would keep you from being included in a list of names along with literature's greats because I consider him firmly one of them. But uh, then again, we live in a, in a culture now where science fiction has become you know, blockbuster entertainment. It's just no longer... But not Wolf's type of science fiction. Certainly not. No, I agree. Um, that takes too much work. So Yeah, it's true. But still, I, you know, when I was a kid in the 70s, I never imagined that we would have photorealistic superhero teams, you know, battling on the big screen like that. Like right, that. yeah. And, and honestly, I'm a bit too old to really appreciate the kind of poor storytelling that they use in most of those Marvel movies. Like, <laughs> so many of these huge franchises, Star Wars, whatever, like, there's millions of dollars being thrown around, and none of it seems to be going to, like, a good screenwriter who could tell a really good story uh, that isn't full of holes and isn't kind of speaking down to a, a mass audience. So it's it's like visually, it's everything we ever wanted, but storytelling wise, it's almost always a disappointment. And that's that's really too bad. But right. nonetheless, if I was, you know, 10 years old right now, I would be thrilled, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 basically animated film, right? Yeah, no. for sure. And I mean, one of my careers in the past was 3D animation. I got heavily into that in the 90s. That that was my job for a while. And for a long time, it was hard for me to even look at any kind of CGI entertainment because I would just stare at it and know how it was done. Mm-hmm. And and so it was hard to enjoy. And I think, um, luckily, that's kind of in my past at this point. So <laughs> I'm able to sit back and enjoy. Plus, the technology has, has come so far. Oh. Oh, what you got going on in the future now that the, everything's opening up? I'm working on a novel. Um, the band is due to tour Europe this November, if all goes according to plan. And uh, my day job is resuming, where I've started booking tours and festivals for artists again. So pretty much just trying to get back on track where I was and and have really... Even though it was a huge disruption, and of course I don't wish anyone to have been sick or died during the last year, I also think there was something really healthy about kind of hitting the pause button on the activity level that I had. I mean, as a as a musician and agent and writer, I'm out three or four nights a week seeing live music and going to the symphony and at different reading events, and there's just always you know a full email inbox. And to, and to sort of have a year break from that treadmill was really healthy and great. Well, all right. Well, good for you and bad for us. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Nathan's interview uh, with Gene Wolf. It, there's a link to it in the show notes. So you can find that in your podcast app or on the, you know, on the Podbean feed on your computer. So, uh, yeah, check it out. And thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much. And uh, if, if you want to find out more about me, my website is nathancarson.rocks. And I'd like to think that I can live up to that. Yeah. Yeah. And the link to that is also in the show notes. So cool. Thank you, James. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This was sponsored entirely by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash rereadingwolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world. 
And if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out by email or by one of the other methods listed in the show notes to this episode.